So welcome yep, to, to this latest edition of our Digital Technologies webinars, or as we call it internally, the ACA Greatest Hits. Okay, um, uh, today, uh, today uh, we will hear about uh, digital systems by Penny and myself. And before we get there, do the proper introductions, um, uh, we want you to try out the annotation feature and see if you can scribble on the screen because we will need that later. So scribble to your heart's content. Very nice, love the hearts. <laughs> right. There's also some little stamps and arrows. So if you click stamps, you can kind of star things. Yeah, <laughs> too easy. Also throughout the meeting, if you've got any questions, just um, type them into uh, the chat window, if you like, um, raise your hand. The good thing about the annotations is I can clear them, <laughs> uh, clear all drawings. Okay, so um, we, we will come back to them later. Uh, Patricia's just joining us. Patricia, we're just use, learning how to use the annotations. You can draw on the screen. Um, will you be using that later in the webinar? Give it a quick go and then we'll move on. Okay, great. I clear that. Otherwise, that will continue on our screen. <laughs> okay, right. I need to go to mouse. Yeah, yeah, it's good. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, clear that. Okay, so we start with introductions. How about Penny? Would you like to, to start? Uh, yeah, I'm Penny. Um, I evacuated to Tasmania, but I'm normally in Sydney. I'm a computing education specialist here. Um, my background's in robotics and mechatronics, so hopefully this digital systems one will be pretty up my alley. And um, my name is Carsten Schulz. I'm the Deputy Academic Director of the Australian Computing Academy, a background in electronics, computer science. Um, if you've done young ICT explorers or papers in the past, uh, you might have uh, seen some of my previous handiwork. Um, so we're all here today in order to talk uh, with you about teaching digital systems. Okay, so what are we covering this week? We are going to take a recap from last week because uh, digital systems cannot be properly understood unless we have a look at data and its representation. So we do a little bit of data representation. If you've uh, attended last week's webinar, um, you might find this hopefully refreshing. Uh, we talk about the role of data then in digital systems specifically, um, then enter into digital systems as a key concept. We look at the secret of data versus code, and then look at algorithms from the perspective of a digital system. And then we conclude with some practical activities or a bit of a roadshow of, um, of resources that you can use in the classroom. Okay, so digital systems here from the scope and sequence document of ACARA is at the top. Yeah, Hure, it's at the top. And that's what we are covering today, what's in that in the box, yes. Okay, I need to clear the drawings. Great, okay. Um, where do you find this? Uh, on the scope and sequence at ACARA website, uh, F to 10 curriculum technologies, and then you need to click on that plus button at the top right. And that's where you find the scope and sequence document. Although I understand most teachers, if not all teachers have seen that document by now, it was quite different when we started our workshops two years ago, um, that popular, the document wasn't so widely used. Okay, right. So data representation, recap. Okay, so um, you would remember from, last, uh, from the last session, if you've attended it, that uh, data representation describes how data is represented and how it's been structured symbolically so that we can store it, that we can communicate, uh, that we can uh, use this um, not just by digital systems, but also by people, okay? That's the overarching topic of data representation. Um, from there is uh, one of the representations are numbers. And for us from the digital uh, systems perspective today, it's the most important abstraction, okay? Because we're separate separating a thing um, from its numberiness, as we call it. And uh, that is very useful um, if you want to compare, for example, the number of rockets with the number of matches. So although these things are completely different, 
the numberiness is the same thing. Okay, so numbers. So, so we'll just do a quick activity. Um, see how many different ways you can represent the number 15. So draw on the screen. If you go, weren't here when we moved in, if you click view options, you'll be able to annotate. Do whatever you like. So see if you can represent it as a, um, you go, any, any way you like. <laughs> yep, writing 15 is classic. We've got some just groupings on the side here, some tally marks. Is that a ruler of 15? That's awesome. Of different boxes, cool. That Roman numerals, nice. That looks like, yeah, binary 15 with some zeros in front so that we can tell. And some maths on the side. Look, fantastic, they were most of the ones that we were just about to chat about. So some of these are off, obviously better for some purposes than others. So if we just wanted to count 15, if we were gonna, let's see if I can just mouse. Um, if we were gonna, just count them dot by dot, 15, you can represent it, but it's quite a long way if you're gonna draw everywhere. Roman numerals is a bit more compact. You can represent it in only two characters. Binary takes four. So they've all got their kind of different uses and purposes. Carsten, if you go on the next slide there. Let's leave that. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. We've got, um, and one back. So we've got tallies as one option. Um, the problem with tallies is they're a bit hard to read and they're error prone once they get too big. So I can't immediately glance at these tallies and say, look, that's 103. Uh, we've got Roman numerals as well, which some people went for. Um, it's better, it's much more compact. You can just glance at that and mostly know what it is. But it's kind of difficult to do maths with. With Arabic numerals, you can look at each column, add them independently, carry the one. Roman numerals is nowhere near that simple. You get these quite odd representations. Um, Carsten, if we go to the next slide, we've also got um, what we tend to use in the Western world, well, the world right now is just base 10. So that means we've got 10 different symbols that we combine in a variety of ways where the arrangement matters, so the order of it matters and the length of digit matters we can build them up to produce these numbers. It works for humans, it's quite natural. We've kind of got 10 fingers, so you can count it up really easily. But if you could imagine an alien race with maybe five fingers or only one hand, then maybe they would have a base five number system. Um, Carsten, next slide as well. And so base 10 is just what we've chosen. Um, humans have chosen base 60 for some things like time and degrees, we've got everything in, 60 minutes to an hour, 60 seconds to a minute. Um, and this is really getting into the, the maths curriculum, but representation is at the basis of what we use in computer science. So that moves us quite neatly on to how data is used in computers and what suits computers best. So in computing, we, we use a binary system, as you know, and that's because at the heart of it, computers work best if you only have two states. They've got either represent a one or a zero. And using just that, we can build up these huge arrays of numbers. Um, and we could have built computers just as well in another system, but we've chosen this, this binary one, mostly. <laughs> um, so next slide, Carsten. Um, overall, Computers use the binary system because we couldn't make another system work. In the past, people have tried making computers or machines that can do this sort of thinking and addition for us using um, base 10, but it just became too big, we couldn't do it. And binary, it turns out, is the easiest way to do and think about it. So it's, it's simple, we only need these two digits, we can stack them together. We need a lot more digits than base 10, but that's okay, it's what suits the system. 
Um, so next slide as well. And everything can be represented in this binary format if we're allowed enough digits. So text is just numbers with a translation thing. Images can be seen as the same thing. Audio, video, everything we're doing right now. So we need a lot of data to get this. Um, billions of, of digits to get all this RAM. Um, <laughs> so we've written computer science has taken data representation to a bit of an extreme sport. Um, anything that, that can be represented normally can be represented by these ones and zeros. And that's what we really want to get across in the curriculum quite early on, uh, late primary, early secondary, that everything can be represented in whole numbers and that can be used, be the binary system. Um, and it's something that you can appreciate and notice everywhere. So as an example, we, um, next slide, we use the binary system in text as well. So each character is represented by a number. Unicode is like a table that lets us look up and translate. So a lowercase a is 97, b 98. So if we go to the next slide, we have these huge tables that computer scientists use. It looks like a total mess, but in your mind, you can just block out most of it. Look at the red text on the, each side. You've got describing what the character is. Null spaces at the front, you can ignore most of that. And if you just look over to the right-hand side here, you can see, draw, you get to see these actual letters. And then we've got what it is, decimal, hex, oct, and htm. So in this, using hex, which is kind of an easier way to see binary, the word pig is represented as 50, 69. So 50, we can look it up over here. 69, which if we look down the table, is here for an I. And then I've got that in the way. <laughs> 67 for G. All right, so we'll give it a go just to understand this. So next slide, Carsten. Yeah, just one point uh, I quickly add here. In the early days of the internet, um, sometimes when you received an email from, let's say, the Far East, you couldn't read it. And the reason for that is that that was before Unicode. So uh, they used different tables. And we use different tables. So the message would have been encoded with one table. And then your, your computer browser, your, your mail client would try to decode it with another table. And then you just got something that looked very cryptic. And um, so it's very important that when we communicate that we use the same tables to encode and to decode. And today with Unicode, okay, that's take, taken as a given. Um, but back then, in the early days of the internet, um, we sometimes didn't do that. All right. All right. So given that, have a go at decoding this message. Um, if you write it above each letter, you can kind of do it together. If someone starts at the start, someone starts at the middle or end. Code breakers. The text section working. It's a secret. Fantastic. Well done. Yeah. Yeah, that and move to the next. Okay. Right. So um, uh, thank you, Penny. Um, we we now move into that part of the digital systems where we where we look um, into. Oh, sorry, Penny. Do you want to recap? Maybe you used um, maybe. 
uh, just on this. Oh, it's all good. The main takeaway is that we've used this number representation for absolutely everything in computing. So even if it's not exactly this sort of lookup table, it's, it's all the same concept. We're translating these numbers into something real that the human brain can understand. And we were a bit mean because we used the hex numbers, um, which um, because we, you, you're very clever people, so you would have seen the, 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 the base 10 numbers before. So we thought we'd just make it a bit more challenging for you. Thank you. You coped all very well. Okay, digital systems. From a historical perspective, so a fun fact, um, I grew up in Germany. Surprise, you hear it from my German accent. But I also grew up in the Black Forest where they not only have fantastic cake, which I highly recommend you try if you have the opportunity, but um, also grew up in the town that was the, the center of the um, German cuckoo clock industry in the Black Forest. And there's now a fantastic big museum, the German Clock Museum, where you see very nicely the history of um, a technology that ultimately led to the computer. Now, from a historical perspective, the reason why we didn't have general purpose computers earlier is for two main reason, reasons. Uh, the first one is that um, the, the scientists at the time tried to apply the decimal number system. Now, the decimal number system is, from an implementation perspective, um, hugely complex because you need to build switches that have like 10 different outputs. And that is very difficult if you only have mechanics available. So the early um, computers or computing machines, they were uh, mechanical and they had cogwheels and the like. And when you build um, a computer with cogwheels, you've got all the issues with um, um, friction, you've got the issue with manufacturing fidelity. And that's why often the um, mechanical computers uh, couldn't be built, okay? Uh, for example, Babbage's difference engine could only be built partially even with today's manufacturing techniques. So look at this, that here. That's, these are wonderful um, mechanical computing machines, usually very specific. Uh, some of them, not sure about this one, this looks familiar as if um, some of them computed the tides. So at the ports, they needed to know about the tides. Um, so they hard-coded essentially the program in, in these mechanical machines. Uh, they work, they do one purpose and they're not very um, easily to change if you want to run another program. Okay, so what happened? So why do we have computers today? Why do we have digital systems? Why there came a breakthrough, two breakthroughs actually, and when they converged, they laid the foundation for digital systems. So one, um, was the conceptual, the mathematical side. Uh, a certain George Boole introduced the Boolean algebra that was in 1854. And um, a little bit later, um, the Americans started to build their telegraph or system from, from east to the west. And they used um, uh, so-called electromagnetic switches uh, quite widely. Uh, these are the relays. And nobody made the connection back then, otherwise we could have had computers perhaps a couple of decades earlier. But once they came together, these two concepts, the Boolean algebra, with it, which is binary, and the relay, which is on and off, it all clicked and made sense. If you want to read more on that, I highly recommend that book from Charles Petzold called Code by Microsoft Press. It's a wonderful uh, read um, and it, it describes that uh, historical site very well. So up on the left corner here, you see a relay. That's a relay. So it's an electromagnetic device or electromechanical device. And the electro part is here. The spool creates a magnetic field. And the mechanical part is here on the left, okay? And that field then pulls a magnet, all right? Or a metal, metal part, and then it closes the contact, okay? I've once built a four-bit adder with with uh, relays, it's good fun, click, clack, 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 and you see the machine adding. Now, um, when we built the first electromagnetic computers, okay, uh, these relays were open. Uh, this one here is a more modern relay, it has an encasing. So in the early days, they could be open, and then a bug might find its way into between the contacts up here, okay? And that's, of course, where the term, in terms of our computing world, debugging comes uh, on when uh, Admiral Grace Hopper noted in the 1940s that relay number 70 in panel F had a moth in it. Okay, 
And that is the first actual case of a bug being found in a computer. Now, uh, the term uh, debugging was already used since we believe the 1870s, but through that um, note by Grace Hopper, uh, that became the standard language in, in computing. And that's why we still do debugging today when we try to fix issues. Usually we do debugging in code, but if you build um, a computer, if you build hardware, like I sometimes do, then you do also debugging hardware sometimes. Right, so here's, the, here's, a, here's a little bit of a thought experiment for you just to make the point of how amazing computing is and how far we have come. So uh, a little while ago, I ran a little thought experiment. I thought, could we build a transistor, sorry, a, a microprocessor with relays? Okay, what would that mean? And um, it's not uncommon for a processor these days to have a billion switches, billion transistors. Um, and if we said, look, let's use a relay instead, and we assume that each relay would be rather small, like the size of a sugar cube, um, running on five volt, which is standard, and consuming about 50 milliamps, then that one billion switches um, processor would be the equivalent of a 2,000 cubic meter cube, okay? Um, that's 12.6 meters in each dimension or a four-story building, roughly, which is pretty big. Now, if we wanted to power that thing, um, it would, uh, this thing would consume 250 megawatt of electricity, which is about half the size of a small coal-fired power station. Yes, we do have the coal in Australia. We could do that. And it would burn about 700,000 tons of coal annually. That's just a little bit too big to put into our pockets if you wanted to carry that device with us. Okay, I've written that down in this blog and when you get the slides, um, have a look there and, and follow that blog. It's quite interesting. But we don't have machines that are that big. We do not burn um, 700,000 tons of coal annually to run a single computer processor. We've progressed from there. Um, and I'm coming to that shortly, but our modern computers, I just want to leave that with you, our modern digital systems are actually an, a testament of impressive ingenuity and achievement, but also at the same time an admission of our great failure to deal with the complexities of the decimal number system in hardware. Only when we went to on and off, when we made it so simple that we couldn't do it any simpler, then were we actually able to build a digital system. So they're amazing, but they're also an admission of our failure to do the, the thing that we originally wanted to do in the decimal number system. So the, the, probably the most impressive, uh, the most important invention of the um, last century was the transistor, okay. Um, it's, it's the lifeblood of modern computers. We've got billions of them on a single chip and we have billions of these chips in, in the whole world, but these are very tiny switches without moving parts. They can be mass, mass produced and now making a transistor on a chip is cheaper than printing a letter in a newspaper. Okay, that's where we've come. Okay, that's mass production in these huge multi-billion dollar fabs by AMD, Intel and what have you. And, and we learned over time how to combine these transistors in different ways to form gates. And from there we formed memory and counters and adders and so on. And these are all the, the, the components that make uh, a digital system tick. So you can think about, or uh, you can think of a transistor as about the equivalent of a cell in a biological system. Okay, so I spoke to about Boolean logic earlier. Our scientists and engineers, they found ways to combine these switches in various ways to form um, logical functions like AND, OR, NOT, NAND, and so on. And they then formed higher level functions um, such as memory adders. So keep that in mind, and maybe that's a thought to convey to your students. When we use a computer, when we use a computer, we really work with billions of cleverly arranged switches that go on and off at amazing speeds, almost light speed. And, and they're absolutely precisely orchestrated. And when something goes wrong, your computer crashes. Okay, but usually it doesn't. And consider the complexity of your system. I mean, I've got a processor here, I've got memory, I've got my screen. I don't know how many billion switches I have in front of me right now delivering this presentation to you. And then there are other billion switches sitting between us, which make up the internet. 
which sends the data traffic to you, and you've got another couple of billion switches in front of you, your computer and your laptop, in order to decode that information and present it to you on your screen. So the order of magnitude of this complexity is just mind boggling, and it works, which is absolutely impressive. And every action in the computer is founded on the laws of absolutely precise logic. Even when we go and listen or get fake news on the network, it's still based on absolutely precise logic. Isn't that amazing? There's an activity which uh, we don't do here, but which I highly recommend. Penny made it so many, I give this back to Penny and say, <laughs> Penny, say, say, say a few words about this wonderful activity. Oh, it's, um, it's looking at logic gates. So we touched on them earlier. Computers are running on these little transistors that have on or off values. And we use logic to transform these, the values in these little switches to one final answer. And you can say that that's kind of all computing is, is looking at all these different inputs coming out with one answer for it. So students are learning how to trace the same logic that computers do in order to check whether a light's on or off at the end of it. So it's kind of teaches algorithmic thinking and is used as the basis for all digital systems. So that leads us into digital systems. So the definition in the curriculum is a system that processes data in binary made up of hardware controlled by software and connected to form networks. So Carsten's touched on the hardware a bit here. Um, I'm sure you've all heard quite enough about the software. Um, and we've also got, you know, system processes in data binary and produces hardware, software and users networks. So those are the key words in digital systems. And that's all that the curriculum touches on. So learning what these systems are, learning what the hardware is, learning what the software is, and learning how they form networks. So if we go to the next slide, the definition of the system is just that it contains multiple different work, different parts that can all work together. The network is how it works together. So the internet is an example of a network that can connect to different computers. It could be as simple as just a wire. If you think of an old, old telephone or an old telegraph, uh, once you connect a wire between two distant locations, between two different pieces of hardware, you've networked them and you can create that system. Software is the, um, is the data and the digital part of it. So it's the data, it's the code, it's what we can change. So if you've got a computer, an iPad, anything running software, but plenty of things run software that you wouldn't think of. So if you've got a modern car that has um, ABS and automatic braking system in it, that's running software constantly to check whether your tires are slipping and how to fix that. And the processing is kind of the output. It's the hardware and the software producing that outcome, or that desired outcome in most cases, if it all goes well. So we've got a quick activity here. We've got a list of a couple of uh, systems, some of them are digital systems, some of them aren't. So grab your little stamp and put a star next to the ones that you think are digital systems. Oh, we've got one next to the fancy cart, the internet. Yep, that's definitely a digital system. I'm just saying we've got the Tesla Model 3. That's got a lot of technology in it. That certainly is. Microwave, modern microwaves definitely, definitely are. Telegraph is. <laughs> We've definitely got more digital systems here than not. Tablet, phone, microcontroller, wind farm. So the ones that, only ones that wouldn't be digital systems in this list would be the campfire and the <laughs> we've got across already the um the 1950s beetle so which which hurts me as a beetle driver that hurts me right <laughs> but it's true <laughs> there would have been a swap over maybe in the 70s or 80s perhaps <laughs> oh, later <laughs> <laughs> but you can see that a lot of things that are and maybe the telegraph you could kind of argue was it was it digital back in the day or it's a bit of a, a borderline case. What do you reckon, Carsten? 
Well, there was no software really, so no. Uh, it was. It but, had the wires, and it was had a bit of an on and off yeah. switches in it, but it wasn't quite running software yet. It wasn't in the reprogrammable. I mean, the human human operator. Yeah, it was human reprogramming. So yeah, the edge cases are a bit. <laughs> Get a bit funny there, but you can see, especially with the cars and with the, um, you've got this old technology is not a digital system, and then suddenly they're being integrated into um, everything that we're doing. Just as we make them smarter, we add more components to them, and same with you know a wind farm versus a campfire. All they're doing really is producing heat, producing energy for us to use. Um, there's a low tech way of doing that, which is just burning stuff. And then there's a high tech way. So digital systems don't have to produce information. They don't have to be just a screen that is showing you things um, or playing a video. It can you know, produce energy as its output or control the production of energy. So if we go on to the, the next slide, we've got the classic examples of a digital system that you'd kind of expect younger students to understand be the internet as the connected devices, the computers, the tablets, their phones, um, a microcontroller. So that's really getting the idea across that digital systems are in the physical world. They're not just my computer. They're not just my like, fancy smartphone and the computer processor, which is kind of the, the hidden side of it. So for the younger students, we've got these um, We've got some activities to teach them to recognise digital systems. It's just a couple of find a word um, sort of thing you can do at home in isolation or as a way of teaching technology where you're unplugged. So we've got a few of those on our website. We're not going to go into any more detail with them now, but you can feel free to follow these links. This will all be posted and have a look at that. All right. Uh, coming to the curriculum uh, um, uh, unpacking, so uh, as already mentioned earlier, in terms of digital systems, by the end of year two, we uh, expect students to recognize and explore digital systems, um, maybe to discover um, digital systems. By the end of year four, we uh, want them to identify and explore a range of digital systems um, with peripheral devices for different purposes. That can be as simple as a keyboard and a mouse com connected to a computer, right? Um, and starting to understand that they transmit different types of data. And when you think about it, the mouse that's connected to a computer is transmitting data um, uh, to the computer. It doesn't have to be a wireless network. And by the end of year six, we want students to examine the main components of common digital systems and how they may connect together to form networks to transmit data. Uh, that can be networked computers that uh, exchange email, for example. Um, by the end of year eight, we're looking at uh, how data is transmitted and secured in, in wired networks and wireless mobile networks. Well, mobile networks are wireless as well. And, and how the specification of the data affects performance. We've got an activity on that, which I'm going to talk about a little bit later. And then by the end of year 10, um, which is optional, investigating the role of hardware and software in managing and controlling and securing the movement of data in network digital devices. Um, that's a huge topic in the whole Internet of Things uh, because there's now heaps of hardware out there which is not being going to be maintained. It's going to be massive security risk um, now and uh, a couple of years from now um, because there's hardware and software now out there in the open that's not being updated. So securing the movement of an access to data is going to be very interesting. And here's the summary, of course, of what I just said. Right. Um, if you want to hear, we're not at the end of the presentation yet, but from the un, un, uh, unpacking part, um, uh, we highly recommend uh, the four curriculum authors got together and they wrote a bit more about that and unpacked a bit more than what we can uh, can present here. So if you go to aca.edu.au slash curriculum slash systems, um, you find direct from the uh, from the mouth of the uh, curriculum authors about the unpacking of digital systems. Right, so I wanted to talk a bit more about some of the maybe underlying things here and hopefully you might find this interesting. So what about talk about code in a digital system versus data? What's the difference? Now fundamentally, if you ever asked yourself the question, um, they're the same thing. They're all binary numbers there and, and underneath they're being represented um, 
or they, they are representing electrical voltages or charges, okay? That's what's happening in the digital system. Think again about the little switches that go on and off. They go on and off because we apply a voltage and some current flows through, okay? Now comes the difference. When you look into a digital system, the code is the active part. The code is that inter is being interpreted by the hardware, by the digital system. So a code in a digital system might be switch that component on, switch that component off, okay? Um, store that piece of information. That's what the code does in the digital system. It's the active part, it instructs. Think about your body, you know, move the arm here and there. That's what the code does. Now the data is, so to say, the passive part in the digital system. It's being manipulated by the hardware. And remember, that's the hardware that is being instructed by the code to do certain things, okay? So the data representation and this interpretation of the data is these key concepts that you've heard about in this webinar and the previous webinars, they're very deep at work uh, within digital systems. So remember code is the active part. It instructs the hardware to do th certain things. And the hardware is always the one that manipulates the data. And the code just says do it or don't do it, or store that or maybe forget about the result. Uh, and the data is, the, is the, the, the stuff that is being manipulated by the hardware, okay. Now, if you're impressed now, maybe you are, maybe you aren't, um, think about that further. The clever arrangement of data and code along, along multiple steps is actually an algorithm, okay? Because the algorithm does something to data, yeah, and you're all aware of algorithms. Now, there's information required to make an algorithm. So when, when we code, we actually add information to a system. And compare this to you filling up your, your car with petrol, then you're adding energy to a system so that your car can run. But when we code, we add information to a system. We are information makers in that sense. Biological systems, when you look into them, they're actually driven by information. Each cell is, is a computer from that perspective because it has DNA, which is the code, and it, uh, sorry, that Code, which is the data and the code is actually intermingled. And then there's the hardware, the machinery, the proteins that process that information. Okay, and there's information on the DNA when the reading should start and stop and so on. It's absolutely imp impressive. And uh, I've, written, I've written a blog a couple of uh, years ago, we are working supercomputers. So think about us from the perspective that every single cell in our bodies is a computer, a highly sophisticated computer, much more sophisticated than even the best computers that we can build. But every single cell is an information processing agent. Not just our brains, but every single cell in our body. Now, we can take this and do a little bit of an, uh, another thought experiment. Um, if we took a cell from a human body and gave it to a forensic scientist and asked her to extract the DNA from it, um, Maybe we can write this here. What do you think, how long would that DNA be? Like from one, one, one single cell, how long is that DNA strand? If you like, you can annotate that, this slide here and write what you think it is. The length of one DNA strand or? The length of one DNA strand. One DNA strand. One, one single cell, one single human cell. Any ideas? Three, uh, three meters, yep, yeah, three meters. Any other ideas? Shorter, longer? Don't be shy. Uh, two stars, uh, two meters, I guess that's two meters. Okay, kind of given away here in the slide, but it's two meters long. So single cell, you take the DNA, it's two meters long. Okay, very cool. It's actually very short. When you think about it, it's a, it's a three billion line program that fits in the length of two meters, very impressive. But if we take now the DNA from every single cell in a human body and the chain all these DNA strands up, it's absolutely amazingly long. So in one human body, the DNA is the equivalent of the distance from Earth to Pluto, that former pl planet Pluto that you might remember. And that's 10 trips. So we're talking 74 billion kilometers of, of strand. That's code. That's the code in one human person. Okay. Now we've, the cells have more or less identical copies of the DNA, but just imagine the amount of code that is in one human body. Now, if you think about this, like Pluto is fairly far away, but take this, put this into perspective. 
Um, the New Horizon spacecraft that flew past Pluto a couple of years ago took nine years and five months to get there. And that is the fastest spacecraft NASA has built yet. Okay, so even a faster spacecraft takes nine years to get to Pluto. And that is just 10% of the length of a, sing of a strand of the DNA of one human. Okay, one person. Okay, so there's a bit more to that. Um, and I like these connections to biology. If you think of photon, if we now travel at light speed along that, 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 that line, that string of DNA of one person, that takes 68 hours to travel. 68 hours, okay, the length of one person's DNA. Now, if we take the DNA of every person on Earth, eight, close to 8 billion people who say, look, take, give me all your DNA, if we could do that, and we would just, were to string that all up, we would get a string the length of 630 trips across the Milky Way. And the Milky Way is a pretty big place last time I checked. Um, it's 100,000 light years wide, we think. Okay, just think about it. 630 times you go back to the end of the light of the Milky Way, you come back and then do this again and again and again. It's, it's fabulous. That is all code that just runs in the human species. Now, if we were to take the DNA of all life of planet Earth, we would easily span the whole universe. And the universe is even a bigger place than the Milky Way. It's thought to be about 46 and a half billion light years in diameter. Okay, so just think about it. It is absolutely profound what's happening here. When we look at digital systems, we can also look at our own biological systems and look at the sheer amount of code that's being processed in our bodies 24 seven by 34 trillion cells, absolutely mind boggling. So I personally find this, these digital systems a very interesting entry point into looking at our bio biological systems and how we run. So I guess you could say it's a bit more of space efficient than ours as well. If you've got digital systems or in binary um, and you've got your DNA strands, are just your different um, GA, TN, TNC. So that's you've got almost twice as much information in there. Yeah, and DNA base, is the most compact way of storing information. On you know, base four rather than base yeah. two. Okay, so that's the branching out to biology. Let's do a bit of a road resource roadshow together. That's you, Penny. Oh, that's me. <laughs> All right. Um, so we might actually get um, Carsten to go onto the ACA website and show you just a, few, a little bit of how to get here. So that first one, Smart Garden. So this is getting students to have a microcontroller and connect it up with some sensors, um, test the moisture content, the temperature of plants, and get to kind of automate this system as, as much as they can or as much as they want. Um, so Smart Garden's a pretty classic first example to using microcontrollers and really seeing how it works in the real world. So that was on our website there. We've got a resources tab with all the different challenges that students can do. Um, if you just go into Smart Garden, we've got both a Blockly version for Year 5, 6 students and a Python version for when we're expecting them to code in a text-based um, programming language for Year 7, 8 students. So we've got those two different versions. Uh, I think that's one of quite popular challenge. Um, and that's a really good way of connecting digital systems to something real, something that they can touch. Um, it's kind of the beauty of digital systems and embedded systems is that you take it away from just all codings on a computer and you place it in the real world. Uh, one of the other projects we've got that suits digital systems is Land Party. So this is one that we've made for students working at home. So it's an offline activity for older students where you're looking at how networks operate. So the connections between lots of digital systems, how you can isolate them, um, how you can switch between them, um, how you connect, connect, connect it to make one large and one more useful system than kind of the sum of its parts. So that's on our website as well uh, under resources and it's not one of our courses, it's just under DT at home. So we might go there just quickly. Yeah, just think, let me demonstrate. Okay. Great. 
Uh, sorry, everything's a bit slow. It's all, all good learning these. DT at home. So click on DT at home and there you find our latest unplugged activities that we did um, during um, COVID-19. So kids can do all sorts of unplugged things at home directly. LAN parties here. Here is LAN, LAN party. We've got these little icons at the side. Actually, if we just, yeah, that's LAN party. Uh, we've got the curriculum concepts that they link to at the bottom. So if we just scroll down slightly, we can see that this covers the connecting digital systems and transmitting data. So the networking part of digital systems for older students. And if you go back to the main side, you can see this little digital systems icon here is also at the front there. So that's how you can find these digital systems based resources. Uh, the other one we have that's pretty related to digital systems is network security. This is a cyber challenge. So it was made in conjunction with, I'm just going to clear that drawing, um, made last year and it's all to do with network securing data. So this is rather than just connecting them, we're looking at securing them against outside threats, make it them robust as possible. This uses microbits as well. So similar to Smart Garden, you're taking something that can be a bit conceptual and putting it in a real physical digital system that kids can use and play around with. So that's found uh, in the same bit of our, as our first one. So under resources, one of our, um, under the resources tab, it's one of our DT, not a DT challenge, rather cyber challenges. And then we also have, you saw some of these earlier. So part of our DT at home collection, we've also got the digital systems find a word for some younger students. Um, in the early stages of the curriculum, we're really looking at just recognizing digital systems, what they are and point at it and make sure that you understand that this is where code is running and then building on top of that understanding. Uh, we also touched on the logic gates activity. So that's another DT at home activity you can find on our website at a similar place to the land party one. Okay. Um, yep. Sorry, Penny, go ahead, please. No, go ahead, Carson. Oh, oh, uh, here's again the link. <laughs> All these resources, plugged and unplugged, cyber challenges, DTs challenges, large challenges, short challenges, um, with computer, without computer. Hopefully there's something for everyone there. And if you don't, if, if you think it's not there, let us know. We make it. Um, there's an unplugged activity, uh, which I mentioned earlier, that's called Tablets of Stone by uh, CS Unplugged. It's a wonderful activity. Um, to to do uh, to to explore how the internet works because there's a router in there, and the teacher can play the role of the router and uh, reject packages, drop packages. Um, the only downside of the description here is that it is not self-explanatory. So if you read it, you will likely be confused. If you want to know how it works or see how it works, uh, let us know because we've done it. We do it during our two-day workshops, and we're happy to have hop on the phone uh, with you and explain it. Uh, we're currently working on an um, on the explainer video for this activity. So, uh, but it's wonderful to explain how the internet works. Okay, so we are at the beginning, the beginning of the end. Okay, uh, we conclude with a summary. So, what have we learned today? So, the the the, the one thing you've uh, probably recognized that you and your students already know a whole lot about digital systems because you use them every day. You've got access to them. Um, they range quite widely. On the highest level, you can say the internet is a digital system, or um, you can go the microprocessor is a digital system. Whichever level you go to, you pretty much see all the key concepts of digital systems at work. To properly understand digital systems, you have to have a firm grasp on data representation, especially the numberiness of things. And that numberiness, Penny has explained so well, is these two symbols, the ones and the zeros, and we call them binary. We love binary. Underneath, in the hardware, we have these wonderful little machines invented about 100 years ago, maybe the most important invention um, of the last century are transistors which are the lifeblood of digital systems. Uh, they make the ones and the zeros physical, billions of them in just one chip and billions of chips in the world. So it's just amazing how many of them we've made so far. They're very cheap to manufacture. I mentioned it's cheaper to make a tr transistor than uh, to print a letter in newspaper. Okay. And uh, finally, as Penny has showed you, 
Um, there are quite a range of suitable plugged and unplugged resources, some of them from us, some of them from others, um, available uh, for you to teach digital systems. And that concludes our webinars.